balancing work and parenting and online learning during the pandemic, it was really hard. You have anxiety, you have fear. How are you and your husband or your significant other communicating and, and doing? I'm a divorced parent in quarantine. It's very hard to manage my own anxiety when there's not another adult in the house. Like, I'm just gonna say that. here, I eat here, I cook here, I work here, I raise my kids here, and there is no outlet. I take care of adults, but that was someone's baby at one point. That's kind of how being a mom has changed my role as a nurse. Stop saying if our children are going through something and shift it to our children are going through something. If I'm told one more time my son has not come to class, he's right there in the next room. Why you fail gym when you online? What I want to know. Balancing work and parenting and online learning during the pandemic and especially supporting mental health, it was really hard. Therapy has been big for us during the pandemic. We both rely on it, my husband and I, for personal growth and ultimately bring what we learn individually into the relationship. Kids and mental health is interesting because I always find it good to give them some like biofeedback uh, about how their brain works. So to sort of dissect what's happening in their brain and let them know that's all okay has helped us a lot. We're always honest with our kids and sometimes it's really, really hard. We explained what COVID was and why it exists and we told them everything really early on and we just reminded them that we're luckier than most people and we have to do what we can to help others during this time. So at Hello Bello, uh, we wanted to start giving away a year's worth of diapers every week to help parents who need it. So we did that before the pandemic and we just doubled it. And I think that's just the responsible thing to do. When you have a company, you have to be uh, a for good company. Advice I would have for other parents that feel like they're struggling is lean on others. We're not doing this alone. It takes a village is a cliche for a reason. And being a parent is learning that sometimes you just gotta throw away the rule book and you just, you gotta be flexible. If there's one memory that just fully encompasses my parenting during the pandemic, I think it was going to get our Christmas tree. It was such a beautiful December evening and we took the kids and I went to Peru's, grabbed a tree, stood in the line, hear some chaos in the parking lot, realize there's cars that are fighting and people that are fighting and my husband was wrapped up in it and I ran back to the car. The kids were screaming in the back because they weren't getting attention. Everyone's mad. It was absolute mayhem. There were so many tears. It was a complete debacle. We barely got the Christmas tree up, but when we did, it was beautiful. And I think that's a pretty poetic metaphor for this time. Just got to search for the joy amidst the chaos. There's a level of frustration and exhaustion, especially when I'm anxious, um, when the news is scary or when I've been looking at the news too much or when numbers are spiking or, you know, people that we know are positive, you know, even several, you know, people away. I'm a divorced parent in quarantine, so it's very hard to manage my own anxiety when there's not another adult in the house. Like, I'm just gonna say that. What I've decided to do, I decided this really towards the beginning of COVID when I reached out to our the therapist that we use for our family. And she said to me, like, your goal right now is to take care of yourself and to take care of your children. Um, and to not freak out over every single thing. Like, this is not the time to try and like, teach discipline from the ground up or try and take out my anxiety on them and be like, I'm anxious, so now it's your anxiety. 
we do safely order in and so I give myself a break sometimes and order in. Dinners are not super elaborate. Like at first they were, and now I'm just like, eat this can of beans. Like I can't anymore. Watching a movie together, like I used to be like, let's do something educational. And now it's like, you know what? It's okay to just like chill on the couch. So I've taken the pressure off me because especially when there's not another adult, it's really, and I don't have a nanny, I don't have a housekeeper. Like I don't have any of those things. It's just me. It's always been just me since I got divorced like eight years ago. So being gentle with myself, gentle with them. My kids have always been homeschooled. So they're used to the notion of like, mom or dad needs to actually have a life while you're home. <laughs> Whereas I know a lot of friends who have kids or they're like, what do we do now, mom? Like, this is fun. We're all home together, you know? My kids know that like parents work and they work sometimes from home. So they're kind of used to that. Zoom classes are, you know, they're crummy for a lot of kids. If I was a kid now, I wouldn't sit in front of a screen. I'm sure I would lose my mind. We try and take walks. There are places that we can take walks where there's not a lot of people, but you have to drive a little bit. And, you know, we still wear masks and we're still super careful. So that's kind of our story. Hi everybody, I'm Sherry Shepard and I'm the proud mother of a very, very moody, sullen 15 year old teenager named Jeffrey. I am a single mom. My son is my, I call him a miracle baby. He was born at 25 weeks, a micro preemie, weighing one pound, 10 ounces. And he's just been a blessing in my life because I was told that he would never be able to talk, that he would have a lot of mental challenges. And not only does he talk, his first phrase was, mommy, put your wig back on. We talked about COVID and the pandemic and, you know, about staying in and I made it seem like it was very temporary and it's harder for him to understand what's going on. And it's also hard for him to understand because I still get to go out and do work. I just left Vancouver where I filmed a movie. So he's wondering, but why are you going out and you're still with your friends, but I can't be with my friends. So it's been extremely difficult when he would hear that older people with diabetes were susceptible. That scared him because Jeffrey knows that I am diabetic. He's lost a lot of family members to diabetes. So that was a trigger for him, which is why I do my darndest to maintain a healthy lifestyle and to exercise. We exercise together. We ride our bikes together so I can show him mom is good. I'm fine because he gets scared when he thinks of me getting COVID. Just dealing with all of this in protests and marches and trying to explain to Jeffrey that there are people who don't like us because of our skin color. Just getting through George Floyd, getting through Elijah McClain, that one almost did me in because Elijah McClain is my son, Jeffrey. Jeffrey who says, I wanna be a police officer. You know how much that frightens me? When my son says, I wanna be a police officer, that's something that should make me proud. And it was every day something was happening for Jeffrey to ask me, but why was this person shot and they were in their home, mama? I don't know. So to have to explain because you're black is real hard. That's a tough one. For some children, online schooling has worked for them. For my son, who's very sociable, who loves being in the middle of everything, it has been absolutely detrimental to Jeffrey's mental health. He came to me with the dog, that ball that has the dog treats in it. And he said, mommy, I feel like that. I feel trapped and I feel like I can't get out. And that's depression that these kids are dealing with. So I'm tired of the teachers calling me. I'm tired of the emails. I didn't stop answering all of the emails because if I'm told one more time, my son has not come to class, he right there in the next room. How is he not coming to class? How you fail gym when you online is what I want to know. I don't know if that boy is even living here anymore. He might be working at Starbucks for all I know. <laughs> I don't know nothing about what's going on with this child. During COVID, Kim Whitley and I have been best of friends for 20 plus years. And we decided to start this podcast together. It has been a saving grace. And also to our 45,000 listeners. So aside from us just wanting to connect, it's also serving a greater good. We're making people laugh and forget about things for just a moment. My advice to parents that have children with special needs is to lean into them, really listen to them because they'll talk to you. And if you got a teenager, I would say parents, don't take it personally. They are just trying to find their way in this new normal. You're the safe space. You're the punching bag. You're the one that they love on. 
at the end of the day, they love you. I'm your favorite actor. Yes. Oh. She's getting a little emotional. <laughs>I am a registered nurse in the ICU. I have one child, his name is Walter, and he will be one year old next month. I am an emergency medicine physician and I'm located in Brooklyn, New York. I have two children, one is four years old and one is six years old. I am a respiratory therapist and a volunteer firefighter in Edmonton, Pennsylvania. I have one child, she is two years old. I'm an emergency medicine physician in New York City. I have a 13 year old daughter an eight-year-old son and an 11-year-old son in the middle. Being a respiratory therapist and a firefighter are both pretty stressful. The pandemic has heightened that stress, I think for myself and for everyone, just because it's this fear of the unknown. So I'd be on a call with my children's teacher in our workroom, like fully donned in PPE and this challenge of trying to do the work on the front lines, but also doing what you need as a parent as well. There would be times where I would be waking up two, three, four times a night with the baby and then having to go to work and be, you know, sharp and mentally ready to take on a day of taking care of the sickest patients I've ever taken care of. When we were in the midst of it all, there were many nights I came home and I just burst out in tears. Although I'm no stranger to death, the hardest part was just seeing so much. The thing I was most worried about returning to work during the pandemic was just if it was the safest choice for my family. I've said ever since Walter was born that I hope that this is over before he's old enough to realize what's going on. I don't want all of his childhood memories you know, smeared with, well, because of COVID, we couldn't do this or we couldn't do that. The biggest daily challenge, I think, as a parent in the pandemic has been the Groundhog Day nature of the past year, adding in some sort of schedule and variety so that every night isn't a late night and every morning isn't a late wake up. You can't be everything to everyone all of the time. And that is especially true if you're not taking care of yourself. I think mentally, I've definitely had to take some time to find more me time and find other outlets to worry about, as we say nowadays, self-care and making sure I'm okay mentally to be the best parent, the best therapist and person that I can be. Just give what you can and don't beat yourself up over not being able to do more because every little bit counts. What I've learned from the past year is definitely to live in the moment. I think there was so much uncertainty. What we have control of is more in the present than in the future. I think it's the joyful moments that remind me of how great it is to do all of this. When I see my child learn something new, that's the highlight of my day. At work, we, we play a song whenever a patient who was diagnosed with COVID leaves and they get discharged. Everything stops and we play the song overhead throughout the whole hospital. And it's just joy. Both roles, being a parent and a frontline worker, make me better at what I do. I am really lucky in so far as in a horrible year of uncertainty and devastation, I have felt like I could be part of a solution. But as a parent, I'm able to also hopefully give that sense of security and safety to my kids. When I go to work, I, I see people as someone's child. I take care of adults, but that was someone's baby at one point. That's kind of how being a mom has changed my role as a nurse. I have so much empathy for parents right now because my kids have been in homeschool for a year and not seeing their friends. I was doing homeschool with them and trying to upstart the show in the afternoon and it was a complete hot mess. Human beings like go to the I failed immediately. I've had moments where I've just thought, my kids don't look at me as the teacher. You know, I'm not their teacher, I'm their mom, I'm not their friend, and yet they're, I'm all they have. And I saw this tweet and it's like, kids are not falling behind, they're surviving a pandemic. And I thought, some days, like, does that even apply for adults as well? I definitely am not taking things day by day. I'm taking things minute by minute, hour to hour. I hope that there is like a deeper appreciation for everything. 
it's really challenging as a parent of young adults to help them navigate their new life because these are transitional years for them. Our daughter moved out and was living in her own apartment, but during the pandemic, she moved back home. A parent is always their child's biggest example, but all the more in this pandemic because we've all been together and we haven't had those moments to take off for the weekend or go to the gym or, I mean, whatever those little moments are throughout the day, we've all been together 24 seven. It's been challenging and I've just really learned all the more and reminded myself that my kids are always watching and they see how I deal with the stress, how we handle difficult situations. Fortunately for the Beret marriage, the pandemic has strengthened our relationship. All the things that we have avoided for years, <laughs> talking about, they all surfaced and they were in our face and it was unavoidable. My children were the biggest influence in helping my husband and me work through it. And since then, the relationship has grown even closer and tighter. There's always hills and valleys, no matter what. But when you come out of a valley, <laughs> it is like, Ah, hallelujah! You feel like you can accomplish anything. And that's what this pandemic felt like. I've always been a woman with faith values and family values, as has my husband, and that's how we wanted to raise our kids. I don't know that that really would have changed if I had children later in my life. I feel like in my 20s, I was still a very selfish person because I was still trying to figure out my own life and then parent these little people. <laughs> and it's like, my brain hasn't quite matured yet. I probably would have taken a back seat in my own life a little bit more than always trying to keep myself at the forefront. We were always parents first. We created the boundaries and the rules. Do the hard work first because you, you should be a parent first and not a friend when they're young. Now, as young adults, we are reaping the rewards of that. My kids actually like hanging out with me and they like hanging out with my husband and they choose having dinner at home a lot of times over going out with their friends. We cooked almost every meal at home during the pandemic. We kind of like went through the pages of a cookbook and cooked something new every day. And that was really fun and fun to do together as a family. And then also playing board games and cards. They'll go down as some of the best and most fun memories with my family. The parenting never ends, whether they're at home or they live on their own, whether they're married or not. I mean, just like, my parents, I ask them for parenting advice all the time. Sometimes you just like need to hear that old school advice or old fashioned advice and just get back to the basics. It, it doesn't matter what decade you're in, it's just good parenting advice. The pandemic has had a very profound effect on the mental health of both parents and children. Anxiety levels among our kids are rising because this is a new environment. We need to be very empathic and attuned to the fact that symptoms do not show up transparently in our children. We need to stop saying if our children are going through something and shift it to our children are going through something. There is a way to talk to your kids, the first step I tell parents is understand that the anxiety is here for a reason. Every time we feel out of control, we feel anxiety. So give them choices that empower them. Ask them how would they like to set up their school situation? What would they like to eat? Always look for opportunities to validate, empathize and connect. Every age group is going to react to the pandemic or any stressful situation very differently. Young children, they don't really need 10,000 activities. They need simplicity, consistency, predictability, and connection. Now the middle school kids and the high school kids are the challenge because they are forming their identity from the outside world, especially your middle schoolers. Allow them to have more screen time 
with their friends, walks in the park with social distancing. High schoolers are kind of already pros at virtual connection. The downside that you have to be careful about is that your kid will just not leave his room or her room. So you have to connect to them in person, maybe watch their favorite TV show with them because this is the culture of the high schooler. Don't fight them, join them. And then there are our young adults who are just going to start their adult life after college. These are the kids that are the hidden casualties of the pandemic because they were stopped in transition. I tell parents, don't worry, they will launch. Don't put extra pressure on them. Part of my work is helping parents separate their sense of well-being from their kids' well-being because we have to maintain an internal homeostasis so that we can be where they can land. The best we can do is keep ourselves stable because we as parents have to be their safe harbor. How do we help our children go back to normalcy? It depends on our energy. The more we show them through our example that we're relaxed and we give them the attitude that, hey, if mom's sick, she falls sick, she will deal with it. That's all we can do. When they see that, they absorb that. Parents will enter their most empowered selves when they realize that this pandemic or any difficult situation is an invitation to enter the present moment and to simply become grateful for what we do have rather than focusing on what we don't. This is the key of conscious parenting. How I've grown as a mom and what I've learned during the pandemic is learning how to be more patient. There's a lot of noise going on. You have anxiety, you have fear. How are you and your husband or your significant other communicating and, and doing? If your child has a tantrum, how are you gonna handle this? There were moments where if I'm being really honest, where I've lost patience with myself and with the circumstance at hand. I would be sitting here lying to you if I didn't say I wanted to get away. I've had my moments, I've had my tantrums. I've locked myself in my bathroom with a glass of wine. And let me tell you, it was so rewarding. What really helped me is communication, not being afraid to ask for what you need. Mommy just needs some me time. Mommy just needs some space. Doesn't mean that mommy doesn't love you. And also I'll tell that to my husband. You know, honey, I need some space. I feel like that's what makes a healthy unit. A lot has happened during this pandemic. We were dealing with a lot of social injustices. Question here is how do you explain that to your children? Corey and I, of course, we talked about it together and we thought it was important to share with our son, Cree, who's almost 10 now, what's going on. We have been very open and honest with him about police brutality, about what happened with George Floyd. And if I'm being very honest with you, for a minute, it caused him a lot of anxiety. He was like, mommy, I'm scared, but I have such a great support system. And my husband, you know, the way that we vocalized it, we let him know, mommy and daddy got this. You are safe, you are covered. Mental health is very, very important to me, especially within the African-American community and especially with women and especially with mothers. I go to therapy. It has been extremely beneficial to just be able to release all of your thoughts, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're going through. I want to continue to bring awareness on this because I want to change what society views as what being strong is. I launched an incredible supplement line called Answer. We have lived through this pandemic where immunity has been at the forefront. We're talking about health and we're talking about how you keep your immune system up. Supplements can aid in that. How can you be the best mom if you do not take care of yourself? What do I not want to see come back once this whole pandemic is over? As much as I love it, I love doing Zoom. I think it's awesome. I am a social butterfly. I love being around people. I'm over it, I'm over it, I'm over it. During the pandemic, I feel like it has been such an opportunity of growth in looking within myself. I feel like I have really been on this path of self-discovery of truth. And so in regards to the kids, my line of communication with them has evolved so much, are sharing the doc with my girls and talking to them about it. 
and watching the ways in which they have stepped up to also help parent my sons. It's just incredible. It's been definitely a struggle. Our sons have not had a play date in a year. You know, they had one, but like literally with someone that was within our bubble. But to go a year, that is a lot on kids. The girls and I were sitting at the dinner table the other night and they were like, we just want to make sure that the boys are like still having their childhood, even though, you know, these are such surreal times. And I was like, wow, how amazing that this 12 and 15 year old are stepping up in this way and saying, we wanna make sure that the boys have a sense of childhood, even though the world feels so different right now. And I was like, okay, well, we did something right. I have a kid screaming right now. I mean, have we made it work? or <laughs> just make it work, you know, however messy and, chaotic that may be um you know i think the the like silver lining of it is that i'm just getting to spend a lot more time with them they're three and four and it's been really extraordinary just to see their development i'm a kids book author and we you know read uh every night before bed you know it's, it's sort of like quiet time i wrote this book though ambitious girl it's my second kids book um, it's very much about the power of language and understanding that ambition is a really good thing, that it means purpose and determination and having a vision and being innovative and having a dream or a big idea and, and daring to go for it. And for me, with kids books in particular, it was a, a really personal experience of becoming a new parent and simply not seeing a family that looks like ours represented on the pages of, of our the books that we are reading our kids. And it's an issue that I really taken up is a working mom or working parent, you know, you're overscheduled, like everything has to work like down to the last second. Yes. Would I love to check out? Yeah. Like all day, every day. Would I love to just it's like literally use the bathroom in peace, like, and not have children at my feet? Like, yes, I would love that. I also have support. My partner is a full-time dad right now. Even with our kids being so young and having a lot of flexibility, there's no way that I could have continued working as I have been without that support. And the reality is that most people don't have that and it is crushing. This you know, idea of going back to normal is one I reject because we know that normal was not working for so many people. Normal was not working for working families. We need uh, health care for all. We need a uh, minimum wage that is a living wage. We need child care. We have an opportunity to treat people better and I hope that we do that. You know, a lot of us are cooped up at home with kids and life and work and everything happening all at once, all at the same time. This moment has helped me at the very least to be like a little bit more self-aware of just like where I am, how I'm feeling, how my mental health is, and, and frankly, like, am I exhausted to the point of burnout and just being better at finding ways, no matter how small, to just like step back. And sometimes it is just the small thing of shutting my laptop or logging off of Twitter. <laughs> I feel like a light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine here and getting distributed um, hopefully quickly. So for me, I'm just taking it day by day. Um, and you know, for a lot of us, I think it just, we're trying to survive and uh, just get through it. My name is Rachel Lauren. I live in Austin, Texas. I am a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional. My ex-husband is a great father and we co-parent. I have three kids. I am actually an adoptive mother. I have a six-year-old daughter, a five-year-old son, and a four-year-old daughter. I'm Vina Crownholm, a freelance journalist. I have been married to my husband, Ryan, for almost 12 years. We have two boys, Eddie, who's 10 years old, and Max, who's seven months old, and a total pandemic baby. I'm Elizabeth Gillespie. I live in Westchester County, New York with my husband and two daughters. One is four and one is almost two years old. Pre-pandemic, my daughter was in preschool and my other daughter was just home with her grandparents while my husband and I were at work. My oldest daughter, I miss being able to drop her off or pick her up for the social interactions. We had just moved to our neighborhood. I would drop her off at school, go in, talk to the teacher, talk to other moms. It was part of my morning routine, all that kind of stuff. Eddie has been homeschooled for the last couple years. We do homeschool days at the Natural History Museum, boys team gymnastics, you know, a ton of extracurricular activities. Once the pandemic hit, taking away all of the socialization was really, really challenging. 
part of my pickup time for him at all these different activities was a socialization for me too with other parents. My son's friends' moms are also my good friends. And so I would come in like 15, 20 minutes early, we'd chat, maybe figure out a play date. Play dates aren't just for kids, they're also for the parents. And I have really missed that this year. Going in studio for me means getting dressed up and putting on real clothes. And so while I love the convenience of being home, I feel like I'm missing that little piece of like putting myself together, which really gives me a lot of self-confidence. Pre-pandemic, the thing that was difficult was that I work 45 minutes away from school, but I've been back in person since September. From home, it's like a mile and a half away. I do miss the drives. I was able to think and turn my music off sometimes and ride in silence. There was a, a level of like self-care that went into that commute. And now, although, you know, I'm working from home and there are some benefits to that, I just feel like everything is happening at home. I sleep here, I eat here, I cook here, I work here, I raise my kids here, and there is no outlet. And that can become really taxing. One of my things that I started during the pandemic is getting up in the morning with the kids and we do a little like exercise routine together and then we go for a walk. It's their alone time with me, no phone, and they love it. And I normally would have never done that going to the office, but I think I would love to continue that. There's a few things that I started doing during the pandemic that I'm gonna keep doing. One of those things is cooking a new recipe with my son every week. I probably made a hundred loaves of bread. We just kind of went on Pinterest and found new things to make. The pandemic did allow us to spend more time together. Just being more intentional about the time that I'm able to spend with them during the week is something that I've definitely learned is important to them, but important to me. I didn't really think about parenting during COVID or during this past year because my kids are parenting me now. You know, uh, they're changing my diapers now, if you know what I'm saying. It was a full year. I never stopped working. But also, both of my children got married. Cassidy in June and uh, Cody in uh, on Labor Day weekend. Like so many things, it was a great blessing. First of all, I saved a lot of money on Cassidy's. We went from 250 people down to 18. Same with Cody's, uh, then over Labor Day. We had 19 people at his in our backyard in Connecticut. Cassidy was barefoot for hers. Barefoot, but barely any makeup on. You know, just, I think her dress cost about 50 bucks. It synthesized it down to what a marriage and a wedding should actually be. Family members and your closest friends, the people that you truly would want there, not a bunch of strangers, no plus ones. It was a beautiful experience. It's been glorious. I'm closer to my children now than I've ever, ever been. They're both very wise. Uh, I can go to my daughter for, for uh, advice, dating, my son is one of the smartest human beings I've ever met, so I, I, I trust him. I haven't won an argument with him since he was six. He came out of my womb in a little suit, carrying a briefcase with a law degree. I've raised smart, loving, brilliant kids. Thank God they haven't written a book yet. They haven't um, been caught naked someplace they shouldn't be. <laughs> you know, any of those things. But the day is young. It's never too late. <laughs> Sweeten, you probably best know me as Stephanie Tanner from Full and Fuller House. Uh, I also have my own wild parenting podcast called Never Thought I'd Say This. I have two girls, uh, a daughter, Zoe, who is going to be 13 in April, and that's terrifying. And then uh, I have a younger daughter, Beatrix, who is uh, 10 and a half. It's not easy to parent. Not easy to parent two girls between the ages of 10 and 15. And it's really not easy to do all of that in a pandemic with each other all the time. In the beginning of the pandemic, I will tell you, the parenting was a mess. The distance learning was a mess. You know, I think single moms in particular need to hear that it's okay to not have it together. Like it's okay to just do your best. And if your best was like, look, we're eating cereal for dinner and watching cartoons for the day. And I can't deal with the distance learning right now then that's what it looks like. And we know this pandemic has affected women um, in much more severe ways than men as far as leaving their jobs, staying at home, losing work, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's it's fallen predominantly on, on moms, stressed to the max and worried and fearful and anxiety ridden. You know, it's hard to be able to give your kids anything. And I think a lot of single moms felt like we we're trying to pull from a, water from an empty well. 
I, I got nothing to give, but I've got to show up and do it anyway. That heartbreak that we felt as parents all year of like, I can't watch just one more event gone, one more little thing that they were looking forward to gone. We take all of that on as parents so much that it was really heavy. And I don't think sometimes I even realized how much of their pain I just was holding all the time and how much of my own pain for them I was. In the beginning of the pandemic, I definitely struggled with depression. I didn't want to get out of bed. You know, I was very open with my kids about saying that I, I struggle with depression and anxiety. I have for a long time and this past year, you know, really just brought everything up and it was, it wasn't fun. But my kids see me go to therapy. They see me, you know, trying and engage in healthy behaviors. They see me take moments of self-care where I'm like, I, I'm gonna go take a bath and this is, this is my, I need to do this for a few minutes. And you're allowed to do that too. And if things are really not in a good space to be able to vocalize that and get help as well. Growing up being a child, actor i put my own expectations of i think how responsible i was at that age so i sometimes find that i have to be a little more for forgiving of them just being kids parenting is hard on a good day parenting is near impossible during a worldwide pandemic and no matter you know if you think you're doing great today or you think you're doing not so great today just do your best and just tell your kids that you love them and start again tomorrow <laughs>
love to all parents out there mm -hmm. that are parenting during this pandemic. I am with you. Just take it one day at a time. Try your hardest to give your best each day, but just know that's going to look different every day. So give yourself grace. <laughs>。This past year has been very, very interesting. Not only do I have four young adults, I still got a baby who just turned 16, and I got this 55-year-old son, aka my husband, and these two dogs. It is a full house. At the beginning, it was kind of fun. And then it became a little problematic when we we all kind of wanted our privacy. But at the end, we really learned some pretty amazing lessons about ourselves. I did a lot of affirmations, a lot of meditating. So did my husband, and I tried to get my kids into meditation and mindfulness. I really tried to give them tools to walk through this. As I started to see their mental health really struggling, all of them in different ways. My son RJ, as many people know, has autism. And his mental health really suffered because he was out of a job. He worked for the Los Angeles Dodgers, and he didn't make the protocol to get in that bubble, that COVID bubble. When he got that job at the Dodgers six seasons ago, it changed his whole world. He became a self advocate. He had a group of friends. He never had friends in his life. To lose that for a whole year was. Devastating to him. Someone with autism, like they thrive on routine and going to work and having purpose and doing things like we all do. And I'm just so happy to report that there's some sense of normalcy coming back. He's getting in with the players again. Very excited that that is happening because it was an extra tough year for him. I'm so excited about delivering jobs. It's just an amazing program. I partnered with Special Olympics Autism Speaks and Best Buddies to procure jobs for young people on the spectrum and also different special needs. It's a good thing for your bottom line to hire someone who communicates differently, who thinks differently. This is an awesome platform, and I'm so proud of it. Got a little sidetracked by COVID, but we're we're up and running, and we're going to continue to advocate and hopefully get these a million jobs. For these young people, RJ was told he would never be anything when he was three years old. So he was nonverbal for many years. He probably didn't really start getting his speech and having meaningful conversation until he was about ten. So those early years were difficult because I couldn't communicate with him. Now he says what he feels, and it comes from such a pure place. Sometimes a little bit too much honesty, but I feel so blessed. I mean, so many kids with autism don't get language, but they are able to communicate in other ways. He's 23 now, and now when I look at all that he's accomplished, you know, I just want to tell that story to give hope to someone who has a three-year-old who's getting diagnosed today. Don't ever let anybody tell you who your child is going to be and define what their future is, because the possibilities are endless. Parenting has been a roller coaster. Some days I feel like I'm at a three-ring circus. And I want to be the ringmaster, but I'm actually the tightrope walker.、And、I'm very aware of the, you know, the privilege and the and the ease at which I have certain things. But it's emotional. I mean, caring for children at home in New York City, hunker down in an apartment where we don't have huge pieces of land, and we are like the classic New Yorkers that did not own a car before the pandemic, and so we. Bought a car early in the pandemic, and we drove down to, the, to South Carolina for a month over the summer, and went and stayed by the beach, and had this amazing month together as a family that we would have never done in a million years. I had never gone on a drive that long in my life, let alone put my babies in a car and take them twelve hours, thirteen hours south of here. And then, you know, we got to go shoot Top Chef. In Portland, Oregon. So I moved my entire family to the West Coast for two and a half months. And when Top Chef kind of set out to do it, I was a naysayer. I was very concerned about how this was going to work for my family, both physically, from a safety standpoint, and emotionally. My children were getting COVID tests every 72 hours, just like I was. Explaining to my daughter that even though we were in a new place, she couldn't really make friends because you have to be wearing masks and you have to be outside. There were a lot of challenges, but we did it, and there was actually a lot of really beautiful moments for my family, as well as the fact that I was able to be productive and get back to work. It was really an amazing highlight of the year.
I started COVID-19 with a newborn baby and a five-year-old. I was gonna take maternity leave for the first time and then COVID hit and I found myself canceling my maternity leave. I found myself barely having time for this baby, having to save the organization that I've spent 10 years building, one of the largest women and girls organizations in the world while I was homeschooling my five-year-old. And I would just end every night just exhausted. It took everything out of me. And then September came around and the schools didn't open. And we went from grinning and bearing it to like barely surviving. People were making decisions about our lives that we had no control over. No one asked us. They just assumed that mothers would do it, that we would homeschool, that we would be tech support, nannies, all the while that we were doing our full-time jobs. And quite frankly, it's what stay-at-home moms have been dealing with for so long. Well, you thought that perfectionism would die in a pandemic. It is alive and well. And I think so many of us feel like we're just not seen and we can't complain about it. I think about that as a daughter of refugees. They had to literally save and scrap everything to give us opportunities. And I think about like what they would have done if they were living through the global pandemic and they wouldn't have been able to make it. So much is broken fundamentally in our society, but that also means that we have this opportunity to build it back better. Mothers right now are getting crushed. Our labor market participation is where it was in 1989. We lost 30 years of progress in nine months. And the reason for this is two major reasons. One, it's so many women can't afford childcare or you know cut back their hours. You know, the second reason is that many women found themselves in jobs that simply weren't pandemic proof, like healthcare, education, and retail. And most of those jobs are not coming back. We're calling for a 360 plan, a Marshall plan for moms to shorten the economic recovery for mothers and to build it back better. You know, Meghan Markle said this, and I so agree with her that the most important title that I hold is mom. And we have relied on mothers too much and we haven't valued their work and what i'm excited about is maybe just maybe for the first time we can value it hi my name is dr cheryl ziegler i am the author of mommy burnout a doctor of psychology and a child therapist I wrote the book because we have accepted that high levels of stress in our lives and having to do it all and run it all is what it means to be a mother. What the pandemic has done for moms, how it's affected their, their own lives has been lack of connection with other people. Moms are the ones that have had to exit the workforce, putting their own educational aspirations or career aspirations on a hold or a back burner to take care of what their kids need. So when Moms can't take care of themselves. We see things like higher levels of stress and more irritability, increased alcohol use, more depression, more anxiety. So it's been equally, I think, as tough for um, the moms as it's been on their kids as well. When people ask about moms having tantrums or, or uh, mommy meltdowns, that happens because there's a need that's not being met. What it looks like for moms when they've hit their breaking point. First, it looks like fatigue. Chronic exhaustion is very real. Second, it looks like poor hygiene. Moms are just putting on a decent shirt, trying to just make their background look halfway decent. It also can look like disrupted sleep. Moms feel like they need to stay up, whether it's to clean the house or just get 10 more emails out. All of that is a significant effect on stress. Do moms have permission to have meltdowns? And if they do, oh my gosh, what if their children see it? It's not if your child sees you have a meltdown, it's just a matter of when. When we are talking about mommy meltdowns, it's gonna look like they yelled, they snapped, they drank too much one day, they're highly irritable or emotional. And the feelings that go along with that are oftentimes guilt, frustration, anger, depression. We all wanna think about healthy ways to express our emotions, but we're human beings. And sometimes our kids do not see us as individual human beings with our own feelings, our own fears, our own lives, because we serve them so much. I think mommy meltdowns are okay, especially if they become a learning experience. It goes to unhealthy when 
you had very loud or scary words or you broke things or slammed doors, that's rage. Rage means you've gone way too far. When moms lose their cool, I have four pieces of advice that they can use immediately to try to address what just happened. The first one is stop and breathe. Two, repair your actions or whatever you just said with your kids with a simple apology. The third one is think to yourself, why did you blow up? What's been going on? What was the trigger? What do you need help with? So take some time to ask yourself some questions. And the fourth one would be, when you have processed everything, talk to your kids in age appropriate ways about managing your own stress and managing emotions. I was at the West End in London when it all came to a screeching halt. And then I came home and, and uh, had the London version of COVID, so dealt with that. And at the time it was in March, so you didn't know whether to go to the hospital, how bad is it gonna get? Is my heart palpitating? Am I gonna have a heart attack? Can I breathe? So that was um, an interesting March to, uh, to say the least. Two of my children that were out in California didn't come home uh, because obviously uh, it was too risky. Um, and uh, one of my, my eldest moved out of the city because she was, uh, she's a Pilates instructor and, and uh, she was at Equinox and, and all her clients were not even in the city or not seeing anybody uh, at their houses elsewhere. So that made a, a change of location for her and she ended up doing most of her classes uh, in Zoom in, in, the, in, the, in the gym, in, in our home gym. So that uh, was an adjustment. My daughter, who's a singer, um, Lion Babe, um, she had to do concerts virtually, you know, out of her space worldwide. So everybody adjusted. Um, and we finally saw each other because my, my ex-husband turned 70 last year and we all uh, had a, a wonderful um, celebration in October. So that was the first time the whole family was together. As long as they stayed put, which they did, and they were very careful. And uh, actually my son just got his uh, vaccine yesterday, but uh, you know, my mother lives next door. And that was the biggest, I think, um, since I already had it, uh, I, I, I made it through fine, but my mother's 81 years old. So that was the biggest concern in the family. And um, she's been great. She just got her first vaccine. A couple of weeks ago, she gets her second on Sunday. And uh, that's kind of that big check off the box where I feel safe and, and she's very, very active. So um, now that she's fine, we're all good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sharon Feldstein, and I'm uh, Jonah Hill and Beanie Feldstein's mom. Hi, I'm Taria Joseph, uh, mother of Alicia Keys. I'm Patsy Noah, uh, mother of Adam Levine. I have a really great relationship with my children. We're very close. We talk a lot. Last year, Beanie had done book smart. So we were going from like the Golden Globes and she presented at the Oscars to lockdown. It was like, what? As the matriarch, I guess. I said, ah, it's gonna be 30 days. It's just gonna be 30 days. Let's just stay home for 30 days. We'll play Monopoly. It's gonna be super fun. I kept telling them how super fun this is gonna be for 30 days. Beanie lived with me for eight months. You know, she was pretty strict, especially because as she, they refer to us is, we are so old that she didn't wanna get it and give it to me, cause then she'd feel guilty. So like her every day, it's like, I must've heard every day this year from Beanie how old I am. When things shut down, they shut down. They shut down for everybody. Their tours were canceled. You know, uh, they were all releasing new albums. That that all closed down because nobody could get together to do that kind of work. So it closed down, it closed down. I mean, it didn't stop Alicia. She worked for everybody and talked to everybody. And her songs just happened to fit into this time. She's in California, so what she does, I usually read about it. I have her on Google Alerts, as my friends know. We all have Google Alerts. All of us have Google Alerts on our kids. In my case, my relationship with Adam, who's my high profile child, and my other two kids, has really only deepened in one way. We check on each other more, um, even if it's a minute uh, a day. We don't see each other. He's got very, very little kids uh, that are consuming him. and. And they've done a lot of behind the scenes Maroon 5 work. They're releasing singles and another album at the end of the month. It's hard to, you know, um, miss seeing your grandkids at each stage other than on Zoom or, or FaceTime. My grandson just called me a week ago. He's five. He said, I'm really sad 
and we talked about why he was sad, but we worked it out. And, you know, it's, it's being a mom is universal. Um, you know, being a grandmother, maybe sometimes you just want to talk to someone who's not your mom about something that's making you sad. So it's had some interesting twists and turns. Your Mom Cares are celebrity and influencer moms banding together for kids' mental health. I call us the Netflix of nonprofit because we fund other people's projects and we also fund our own. So we are boots on the ground, but we're also funding very innovative, advanced projects that diagnose and treat depression and anxiety before it becomes something worse. What's interesting to me is that everyone's like, wow, you know, you're doing mental health. You know, it's so important now. It was so important before. We were doing it before. The epidemic and started before with kids' mental health. It's been exacerbated. They call it a tsunami now. In terms of, of going back to whatever the new version of normal will be, we also each year for two years in a row now put out a, a back to school um, mental wellness checklist. It's a virtual toolkit. And this coming year is gonna be the biggest challenge of all because by September, I'm sure that almost all schools across the country will be going back to a more normal version of school. And this coming year, we will work on something that will make sense for what is happening in August and September of 2021. I never expected this year to go the way that it did. I'm, I'm still in awe that one year has gone by. I've got such a great daughter who's always very caring and checking up on me all the time. I think I've just grown in my admiration of her ability to keep mothering and challenging her kids and still doing all her work and still being a good wife. You know, think about this past year. Who could you trust on the news, what you read, blah, blah, blah. But a mom always has, in, well, most moms always has their kids. I've heard people talk about Taria like as if they, she was their mother other people's kids best interest at heart it's not self-serving so i do agree with you i think moms are more important now than ever hi ladies i'm so excited to chat with you both i mean you have so much in common you're entrepreneurs, business owners, digital influencers, fashion experts with huge platforms, and most importantly, amazing moms. So we're going to talk about it all. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about your family and how you all were impacted once the pandemic hit. I think the very first few months were incredibly challenging for most parents, if not all. I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old. I'm just grateful that I have other mothers like Paula that are just friends that we could all kind of, you know, share notes and um, lean on each other. Yeah, 100%. I have a three-year-old boy and before the pandemic, I feel like I was super nonstop. I suffered with mom guilt all the time. And so when the pandemic hit, I felt like I definitely um, hit a pause button, which was actually pretty amazing. You are both business owners. Christelle, I know you have Bumo and Paola Blank Itinerary. What does being a boss, an entrepreneur, a CEO, what does that look like right now? I built Bumo during the pandemic. It was in the midst of this global crisis. And so when the pandemic first started happening, we're like, okay, what are we going to do now? And that's how Bumo Brain was formed, which is an early childhood education platform for early learners ages one through seven so i think it's really challenged us to be creative and pivot also it took the pressure off of me a little bit before the pandemic so i was almost like too hard on myself always and i feel like afterwards we definitely had to get a little bit more flexible and also a little bit more creative your personal lives have always at least from the outside been a part of your businesses with your social media platforms how did that make you shift the way that you think about this work-life balance we had to really just reset our expectations of what we can accomplish in a given day and it's okay if your to-do list is not completely checked off and that's something that I've had to kind of come to terms with. I completely agree with Crystal and I'm very grateful that my husband has always been super hands-on but you know you would see all these memes of like no one will ever question a stay-at-home mom again because literally it is a full-time job. Mental health has really taken a forefront. Do you feel like it's 
really impacted the way that you portray yourself to your followers. I mean, Christelle and I, I feel like we're both very, very real to our audience. Just like you want to inspire them to do good or inspire them fashion wise, you also want to be a more positive um, reinforcement for them. It's women have a tendency to kind of keep everything in, right? Until like we blow up. I think it's really important that we, we have that space for ourselves as mothers um, to really take care of our mental health. What are you most proud of when it comes to being a mom? I think first and foremost is surviving, like just the mere fact that like my kids are alive and like my husband and I are married and like we're just, we're thriving. Like that is a miracle in itself. Literally. Our motto is tell the story, feed the soul, make them laugh, heal the heart. So that's what we were trying to do for millions and actually billions of people who watch our content. I think what the pandemic did, it gave us an opportunity to share good information, to prepare others to be a source of comfort. On any given day, we could switch from talking to Dr. Fauci or being like at the inauguration program. And then we'd make funny videos about washing your hands and kind of like giving people hope that we're going to get through this together. But when it came to the summer with the Black Lives Matter, George Floyd events, we felt like it was our duty really to make sure that we showed the world that we're not just about making you laugh and smile, but we also are here on a deeper level. Working together as a family really set us up to be able to cope with the challenges of being in quarantine because we are constantly together. We work together, we play together, everything. So when the pandemic hit, me and my husband, we sat down our kids and we said, this is what's happening. When the time comes, we may not be able to go out and it could be for up to a year or more. We talk to them about their mental health, making sure they come to us if they feel sad, if they feel lonely. And you know, we're people of faith. So we're gonna pray, we're gonna do our best, we're gonna take care of ourselves. I think it was just now this added fear of the unknown. You know, that's really what really impacted us the most. We've always homeschooled our kids their entire lives. As the children were getting older, I was already preparing myself. They were gonna go off, they're gonna start building their lives. Our children that were about to go off to college decided to choose a, a career in entrepreneurship full time. I now got an extra year or two with them to help shape, mold, and be present. And I think that that has been a huge blessing for our family. We have been able to not only spend quality time together, but we've learned now how to survive and thrive at the same time. What's made me the most proud as a mother during this pandemic has been the resilience that I've seen in my children. They have gone through something that nobody in our generation has gone through. They face so much uncertainty. You know, speaking of the kids, we should get them in here. All hey right, guys, you guys come. You guys come. Hi. Hi. One thing that I'm grateful for my parents for doing is preparing us for this. Yeah, they definitely touched on us, you know, being prepared emotionally, mentally, physically, and just for us to just be okay with just staying home. And, you know, I'm thankful that our parents are just very open. And our family is very notorious for having long family talks, like all the time. We just we wake up in the morning, we just talk for like an hour. One of the things I'm really looking forward to after the pandemic is going on a vacation as a family. Yes! yes. I was literally uh, going to Spain. Yes. Yeah. describe my book one day you'll thank me as a collection of short stories essays advice just overall from my life what I've learned so far in my 37 trips around the Sun my favorite chapter in the book would probably be the conclusion um, which talks about what I feel you gain as a mother the most important thing that I've gained as a mom is just empathy not to say that I was not an empathetic person before but becoming a mother opens your heart in a way that you just you can't believe. How to describe my relationship with my daughter Palmer. We're a lot alike. We're both hard-headed, lose our temper easily, but she does have a great sense of humor. I'm very grateful for that. Palmer and I have been making the pandemic relationship work back in March last year when they shut down school. Um, it was just the two of us at home all day, every day, and I've been very strict 
We don't really socialize a lot. It was very hard for me because thinking up little child games and ways to entertain a toddler does not come natural to me. There were days when we would sit on the front porch and I would give her a bucket of water and a paintbrush and I would ask her to paint the house just so I could like take a shower or make the time go by, which is pretty sad and pathetic. She is back in school now and knock on wood, she hasn't been sick. Like not a cold, not a stomach virus, nothing. And it makes me wonder if it's just the mask that they're having to wear in school. So they must work. One of the biggest challenges I faced during the pandemic as a mom is just, I think, the uncertainty. I want my kid to not have to worry about wearing a mask and I want her to be able to socialize and that has really been limited as it should be due to this pandemic. I'm fairly certain that I have GAD, which is generalized anxiety disorder. I've never been diagnosed with it and I'm not medicated, but I'm, I'm pretty self-aware to know that I have it. And with my husband, who's an anesthesiologist, and he's literally in people's airways every day, it's very high risk with COVID. He would leave for work, I would cry, so worried about him. He would come home, strip his clothes in the garage. It was a crazy, crazy time, so it definitely heightened my anxiety. And motherhood in general, I feel like, increases your anxiety. If you're an anxiety-prone person, you know, you bring a child into this world, you're gonna constantly worry about it. I am definitely a control freak. It is a negative attribute of mine. I I'm trying to get better, but I, I finally got to a point where I said, you know what, this is out of my control. I cannot control it. And me worrying about this and ruminating on it is not going to change the outcome. I do not take medication. I meditate. I took a course in transcendental meditation and being able to access meditation has greatly helped my anxiety. You control what you can, but you ultimately have to have faith. And I don't want my child to see me as an anxious person because I don't want her to mimic that. I try to do better, I try to hold it in, and I try to let go. The most rewarding part of being a mom during the pandemic is you are ultimately forced to spend more time with your child. And it's something that I know can be very trying in the midst of it, but I do think for those of us that have had to, we're gonna look back one day and be grateful for this time. She is so young and she's probably not gonna remember this. If she does, it will probably be one of her first memories. I want my child to have a normal childhood. I'm ready, I'm ready for it to be over. Everybody get vaccinated.